Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service. Thank you for choosing to share your Sunday morning with us. And boy, it's been quite, it's been a nightmare of a week. But by the grace of God, we've made it, we are here, and we can spend this time together worshiping our God. So I invite you, wherever you are right now, let's sing together. The first song I've chosen to start our worship set with is the song that says, We are more than conquerors through Christ our King. Oh 
chosen this next song specifically because of the week that we've had together as a country and I pray that the words speak life and hope where needed and that it is a blessing to you I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts 
hearts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I will speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn like a fire oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus cause you're Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday service. It'll be a service with a bit of a difference in that uh, it kind of fits in with everything that's happening in South Africa right now. I'm not sure that we're ever going to be quite the same again, but welcome anyway. You know, one of the most beautiful pictures that the Bible paints of the church 
is it speaks of the church as being a family. And I love the idea of family. A good family is a family that communicate, they talk about the things of life, the things that are important, and even the things that aren't so important. And I'd like to treat today's sermon more as a family talk. So here I am, sitting behind a desk, wanting just to share some thoughts, many of them random thoughts, that I have been pondering over the course of this last couple of days as a result of the things that have been going on in and around our country right now. It has been an unprecedented time, so I don't think we will ever see anything like this again, and I doubt if anybody has ever seen anything like this in this generation in South Africa. But it's a good opportunity for us as a family just to take time, just to reflect a little bit about the things that we have learned and the things that we may have seen, and to ponder a little bit as to where do we go from here. This is a good opportunity for us to all get on the same page to deal with some of the tough issues of life. And I'm assuring you, I don't have all the answers, but I do know that the Bible is a great point of reference for us. And so this fits so beautifully into the theme that we have been working through in our church services of building our lives upon the Bible. And so this is a great opportunity to say, what does the Bible have to say about the situation that we face right now? We've been hanging our thoughts on a verse in Ephesians 1 verse 18 that says, Open the eyes of my heart. I don't know if you knew that your heart has eyes. And when the eyes of your heart are opened in church, we've been dealing with the fact that when the eyes of your heart are opened, you see God as He is. You'll see God as high as lifted up, as holy. That's what the eyes of our heart will see when we see God. We'll also see ourselves as we really are. We'll see ourselves as incredibly sinful, but amazingly loved. We'll also see ourselves through the eyes of our, of our heart. We'll see ourselves as God wants us to be, restored and ready to serve Him, to enhance the value of the church here in the kingdom of God. And so we've been looking at the various views that the eyes of your heart will have. And so today is a great opportunity to look at life through the eyes of our heart as God opens it up to us. So today I want to build upon that foundation and I want to see life through the eyes or through the lens of the scriptures. I want to start off by just saying, you know, some of the thoughts that I have might appear to be kind of random and maybe a little bit not too linked, but I just hope there's something practical today for our family meeting. If you drive down the road in South Africa right now, you're going to see roadblocks everywhere. Everybody's out there seeking to protect or to guard their property, to guard life, to help with the, the police force who are doing a great job as best as they can to help with the military to guard certain things. We're protecting life, we're protecting property, we're protecting whatever we can in order to be able to just continue life in some sense of normality. Everybody's guarding something. And most of the things that we have been guarding have been physical things. I want to suggest to you there's a couple other things that we need to guard at this particular time. First thing I'm going to ask you to do is guard your heart. Because your heart is the is the essence of who you are. And when the heart becomes infected or something in your heart becomes toxic, it's not long before it leads you to a place that you don't really want to go. So, so much of what guarding your heart is all about is almost counterintuitive. Very often, in order to guard our hearts, we have to do the opposite of what we would normally, by a normal human inclination, do. And we need to guard our hearts, the scripture tells us that that is just so important because right now the natural response to what is going on around us is first of all to find somebody to blame. Who can we blame for this issue? Be careful about doing that, folks. Be careful about finding somebody to blame. I know there is always somebody, there's always something, there's always something going on behind the scenes. We all know that that is happening. But it might be legitimate, but it's certainly not that helpful. Be careful what you do with your anger, because anger can turn toxic on you. Anger can turn to bitterness. Be careful about protecting your heart, guarding your heart 
from anger. Anger needs to be used in a positive way. I'm not saying don't get angry. Let's just get angry at the right things. Some of us are very sad right now. There's been a lot of loss of life and our hearts go out to you, good people. We're so with you in the pain of the suffering of loss uh, of loved ones, of friends, of family who have died over this particular time. As if Corona wasn't bad enough, now we've had this as well. And if you add all of those things up with blame and anger and sadness together, what are you going to end up with? You're going to end up with somewhat of a, a hopeless situation. Now, I'm not saying that we don't go through those emotions. I'm sure we will. But let's just manage them. Let me tell you why. Emotions are very fickle. They run high. They run low. Today my emotion is this. Tomorrow my emotion is that. And if you act upon your emotions in an extreme situation, it can end up again leading you to a place you don't really want to be. So guard your heart. Guard your emotions. Don't act out of emotion. Let's rather act out of facts. And those facts will come out as we continue over the course of today and the weeks that are to come. That's the first thing. Guard your heart. The second thing I'm asking you to do is guard your tongues. Guard these lips because they can cause a lot of damage on the one hand and they can do a heck of a lot of good on the other hand. Guard what you say because everybody right now has a story. You can't walk down the street without somebody wanting to share their story with you. And that's great. But be careful when you share your story because like war stories, they can get bigger and bigger. And you will know that exaggeration is a sort of a, it's a form of lying. And by the time you've told your story 10 times and then 20 times and 30 times, your story doesn't even resemble the facts of what actually happened. And you've exaggerated it so much like a war story. And the greatest tragedy is very often we begin to believe our own lies as our stories get bigger and bigger and bigger and more dramatic and more dramatic as we go on. So I'm asking you to guard your tongues from criticism, from condemnation, from complaining. Those three C's, if you can guard your heart against those, you'll be doing really well. But let's use our tongues well. I have seen over the course of this last week a lot of things that need to be commended. Those people who've sat out there guarding houses, guarding at roadblocks, guarding facilities, guarding stuff to protect those assets that we so need to make life work here in our country. We need, to, we need to affirm those good people from every culture, different religions, different ethnic groups. It's just been phenomenal. And the great support that we're seeing coming from places that we never thought would, would do has just been incredible. And so I totally affirm the fact that this group, that never used to talk to that group, but now talking to that group, they have found in the midst of crisis some kind of common ground. And I hope they keep talking. Add value to people's lives. Be encouraging to people. Phone people. I have a friend in America who's phoning me every single day. And I just so, so value that encouragement that comes from good people phoning people and connecting with people. Use the technology to send messages of hope and inspiration to those around you. That's a good use of technology and a good use of your, t of your tongue at the same time. Can I suggest too that we guard our children right now? Because a lot of the stuff that they have seen and we will be watching on TV and talking about so nonchalantly are being listened to by little ears. And those little ears are attached to little minds that probably haven't got the capacity right now to be able to process some of the things that we as adults speak about. So won't you, won't you please just guard what you say in the presence of the children. Let's protect them at this particular time. Let's help them to manage um, our way through this crisis and their way through the crisis by just being very, very discerning. Be quick to express appreciation to people, to volunteers who have been out there, to our police force and to the army, to those who have served us as best as they can. It's easy to criticize, but I've got to tell you, I take my hat off to these men and women who have been doing under very difficult circumstances, way beyond their, their capacity to be able to do. 
they've done as best they can and we need to affirm that the next thing i want to suggest to you is that you've got to keep moving keep moving the moment you stop and the moment you begin to ponder you begin to obsess over certain things people keep moving there's nothing good for you back there there's nothing good for you back there pondering all the things as you wish they had been or if only they hadn't been like that we got to keep moving Let's let the future determine who we are in the present, not the past. Let's stop just talking about the past and let's look to the future. Because I am really convinced that after we've been through this thing, our future will look different. But man, it's going to be great if we can just master the art of letting the future full of hope and, and vibrancy. Let the hope with the help of God determine who we are right now and not the past. The past has got nothing for you except bitterness. Remember the story of Lot's wife. She wanted to look back to the past of Sodom and Gomorrah and she looked back with yearning and confusion to the past and you know where that ended her up to be a place of misery and of bitterness. Don't go there. Don't go there. The past has very little to give to you right now. And then next, I want to suggest to you in the words of my friend Steve Stroop, don't waste a good crisis. This is a, a great opportunity for the church to really come to the fore. It's a great opportunity for you to reinvent yourself maybe, to reprioritize your life, to have a look at your value system, to reevaluate the priorities of the way that you have lived. Because at a time of crisis, you can establish a new normal. And if the new normal is God-driven and God-guided, it's going to be a whole bunch better than the old one. So let's create for ourselves this sense of a new normality in our lives. Let's not waste a good crisis. Now in a practical way, we've got to do some stuff. We've got to turn opportunity into, into action. And I guess too, this is, a, this is the difference between a believer and a disciple. A believer is somebody who, who believes stuff. And I guess there's not many people watching video casts like this or church services or going to church today who are not believers. I'm presuming that 99.9% .9 of them are already believers. Believing is not the problem. Doing, however, is. And Jesus draws very clearly this distinction between being a believer and being a disciple. He didn't tell his disciples just prior, prior to leaving this planet, Go and make believers of all nations. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. If there's a shortage in the church today, it's not of believers, it's of disciples. And the difference between a believer and a disciple is found in our hands and our feet and, and our, our actions. And it's the doing part of our faith that I think is so important. In order for us to be able to do this, we've got to have a bit of an attitude change. And I, I love the terminology that is used in the book of Numbers 13 and 14, talking about Joshua and Caleb. I'm sure you know the story well of how they'd been sent out 12 spies out to spy the promised land. And they came back and it says this, and it says, and the 10 of the 12 gave a bad report. They brought bad news back from the promised land. And Joshua Caleb and Caleb listened to this and thought, what do you mean? Bad news. They said the land is everything that Moses told us it is. It is flowing with milk and honey. We have the produce to, to show you what it is. But the bad news is we can't have it because the Nephilim are living there. These giants live in that place. We're never going to get it. And Joshua Caleb came with a different report. And I want to suggest that there's a difference. We can turn bad news into a good report. People, there's <clears throat> a lot of bad news out there right now, but here's the good report. The good report is we are the church. We are the family of God. We are the appointed of God. We are the agents of God in a world that doesn't matter what state the world is. The worse it is, the brighter our light shines. The more corrupt it is, the more our salt is needed out there. So don't get in your little huff now. And get little, like a little hedgehog and get rolled up and get all prickly and say, don't touch me. No, 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 no. This is not a time for that. This is a time for us to get up and to be what God has called us to be. 
to a degree way higher than we've ever had before. Let's get excited about the opportunities out there and let's turn those opportunities into action. Now I know as you're thinking, you're saying, oh, Jovi, oh, you, that's what you have to say. You know, we, we can't quite get with you on this particular page. Well, let me suggest to you there are a couple of enemies you're going to have to fight. And they're all going to be going on in your head. The greatest war that's going on is not the war that's taking place out here. It's the war that's going on in your head right now. And the war, the war in your head is saying, it's not my fault. It's not, it's not my fault. And if it's not my fault, then it's not my problem. You've got to fight that, people. You've got to fight that. It may not be your fault in the sense that you've been looting and, and doing all that stuff. But it might just well be your problem and you need a help to become a solution to this problem. And another voice in your head is you're going to be saying, well, I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give. And the little that I have to give is not going to be of any use to anybody anyway. I can't do very much. People forget it. Stop saying that stuff. That makes a mockery of the power of the Holy Spirit within us. We can do something, even with the little that we have. And I'm just reminded of that kid with the loaves and the fish. Came to Jesus and said, hey Jesus, you know, I hear you need to feed 5,000 people. I don't have a lot of stuff, but what I have I can give to you. I've got a couple of loaves and a few fish of Jesus. They'll cut it. That'll do it. And so let's take on the attitude of this kid and bring what we have to the table and offer it to God to be used to, to grow the kingdom of God here on earth. Might I suggest too, and I'm not being pessimistic here, I'm just trying to bring a bit of realistic attitude here, by suggesting to you that the aftermath of what we have been through may in fact be worse than the event. We've had a, this last week and it, hopefully and prayerfully it will be dying down even more, but we've had a, an incredible week full of, of sad events. The events are not the problem. The events are going to lead to an aftermath that I think is going to be worse than the problem. I think in South Africa, we're going to have an increase, an unbelievable increase in poverty. The shops are closed. There's no money. There's no jobs. People have been lost their jobs as a result of all that's been going on around here. There's going to be the aftermath of, of gender violence. You've got to take out your frustrations on somebody, so let me take it out on the person who's closest to me. There's going to be kids. Oh, my word, the kids are going to be in dire need right now. The aftermath for the next six months or more is going to be worse than the event itself. Well, on the one hand, I'm sad about that, terribly sad. But on the other hand, I'm excited at the opportunity this gives us to make a difference. It's at this point that I want to suggest to you, let's celebrate the church. Church is a great place. It's a great unit. It's a great unit when it's operating well. It's terrible when it's not operating well. But when the church is operating as the church should operate, there's not a force on earth that can stand against it. Go and read the statistics, people, and read about how social justice has changed because of the church. Go and read the statistics. that will tell you. You can Google that stuff or whatever. You can have a look at that computer thing, and it'll tell you how, how the church has impacted the issues of poverty around the world. Of, of education around the world, of moral issues and, and all those incredible. The church has done a fantastic job and we should be applauding the church for the role that has had in bringing society to a better place. The church is awesome. It is God's agent of change. And we need to be a part. If you are not a part of it, you need to get yourself out of your couch and into a church that is serving the community. That's why Jesus said, salt and light is who we are. Next thing I want to suggest is, please don't feed your fear. Let's practice faith talk. I love the fact that people, even though we're not denying the reality of stuff, we can still practice faith talk. There are great examples. One for me is Abraham. When Abraham was taking Isaac to sacrifice him on the, on the mountain, and he walked for three days processing in his head what he was doing and he was dying to self. He was dying to his vision for his son and his vision of a great nation. And he came alive to God. 
but he practiced faith talk a number of times. He said to the servant at the bottom of the mountain, he said, remain here while the boy and I go to worship and we will return. That's faith talk. When he knew that he had been told by God that he was, he was to sacrifice his son. What great faith talk. And then when his son himself says, Dad, I see the, the altar, I see the wood, but I don't see a sacrifice. And Abraham with great faith talk says, Hey, son, God will provide a sacrifice. Man, I'm going to tell you, that's why we call him the father of faith. He fed his faith. He didn't feed his fear. And so let's be very assertive in this. Let's be very intentional about this. Let me end right now by winding this thing up by suggesting a great picture for you to read. The book of Nehemiah is a book about rebuilding broken walls. I love the story of Nehemiah. And we read about his plan. We read about how he separated the people. We gave them their tasks. We, we, we read about how he split them up into one defending the other while one worked and the other didn't to, to come against the opposition. It's an incredible, incredible story. But you know where it began? is a place where we don't like. It's a place of humility. It's a place of brokenness. When Nehemiah <clears throat> received the news from Hanani about the, the state of the walls of Jerusalem, he got straight on his face before God and he wept and he cried and he pleaded with God. And he did the strangest of things. He identified with the people in their sin. He said, I'm one of them. I may not have been there. I may not to be directly to blame for the state of the walls of Jerusalem right now because I wasn't even there. But I can identify with my people. And go and read the beautiful prayer that he prayed at the end of that particular time of pondering. He repented for sins he had not even committed. He repented for sins of the people and the generations of other people. He owned the responsibility and took responsibility for those things. People, we need to do the same thing. Don't sit there casting blame. We're all in this together. And I need to own my responsibility in the disgrace that has happened around here. He uses the word disgrace twice, does Nehemiah. He says, God, we are a disgrace to you. Look at the state of the, this beautiful city. Look at the state. We are a disgrace to you that we've done nothing about it. And then when he goes to the people, he says to them, you're a disgrace for allowing this to happen. So he's not running away from the facts here. He's just owning it. And he says, I am part of this and I will repent for the sins of the people because if there's no blessing of God, there can be no future. There can be no hope because there is no substitute for the blessing of Almighty God. And so he gets on his knees and on his face and he pleads on behalf of the people and on behalf of the nation. I'm sure you're all familiar with that verse in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 that begins with if, if my people who call by now my name will humble, oh my word, we don't like that, will humble themselves and pray. And while we sit in a place of judgment and a place of not owning our part in this, that's not a place of humility. Humility is going to be the answer to the beginning of the journey forward. Let's humble ourselves. Let's pray. Let's seek God. Let's turn from our wicked ways and let us do that. I am a part of the us. So too are you. And I hope that we will all, over the course of this next week, before we meet again next week, contemplate some of these thoughts. Let's humble ourselves. Let's pray with a depth of, of sadness and a depth of ownership. And I know that this is going to be great. Prayer, first of all, humbles us. That's why it's a good thing to do. And then prayer also, according to Ephesians 6 verse 12, is a good thing because it teaches us who the real enemy is right now. It says, we wrestle not against what? Against flesh and blood. People, the people who've been doing all this stuff, you know what? They're, they're flesh and blood. Our fight is not against them. 
Our fight is not against flesh and blood, it is against principalities, against powers of darkness, it is against the rulers and the, it's, uh, the demonic powers out there. That's where the battle needs to begin. And let me tell you people, that's where the battle will be won. So I urge you this week, let's humble ourselves. Take time every day to focus on your responsibility to be a part of this. Let's wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's a futile, futile exercise. Let's wrestle against the real enemy. And I know, I really know, that we will win this thing if we do that. Let's breathe hope into our nation. Let's talk to people with hopeful, hopefulness. We're not denying the reality. That would be stupid. We're not denying the reality of what has taken place, and there will be consequences to that. Bear in mind the aftermath is going to be worse than the event. That's going to create even more opportunity for us to be the church, to be the salt and the light that God has called us to be. We love you guys. We're praying for you. For those of you who are battling in your businesses and those who have been affected so badly by what is going on, be aware you have a Heavenly Father who has promised to provide for you, to care for you. Just submit to Him and let God's sovereignty rule your thinking right now. Our prayer is with you. We love you lots. Thanks for listening to me. I call this family meeting over. Folks, as we close our service today, I'd like just to invite you to pray with me. And um, let's seek the blessing of God right now. Father, we are so aware of our need of you, more so now than probably any other time, from a physical sense anyway. But Lord, it's good to be on our knees before you today, to declare our love for you, and to celebrate your amazing love for us. Thank you, God, that when the eyes of our hearts are opened, we see you as you really are, and you are awesome. When the eyes of our hearts are opened, we see you as high and holy, like Isaiah did. We see you lifted up. We see you as a sovereign God. We also see ourselves as we really are. We're terribly sinful, but we thank you for that we are incredibly loved at the same time. We thank you too, Lord, that through the eyes of our heart, we, we can see ourselves as you want us to be, restored and ready to serve and ready to join you, Jesus, in establishing the kingdom of God here on earth. Thank you, Jesus, that when you came to earth, that was your mission. Your mission wasn't just to get us to heaven and give us a place to go to. Your mission was to establish the kingdom of God here on this planet. And you declared that over and over and over again. And Lord, today, we at our little church would like to just commit ourselves to you in re-establishing your kingdom. May your will be done on earth as it is in, in heaven. We know, Lord, that we've got some stuff to do. Forgive us for just being believers. We need to be disciples. We need to do stuff with that which we say we believe. Help us, Lord, as we seek to go out into the world right now, a world that is probably just, we've never seen it like this, it's crazy, but a world that needs us more now than ever before. And I'm excited about the church as being your agent of change. All the way through history, the church has done its job. Maybe in some places it's been a little weakened by different things, but in the main, God, your church is awesome and we're so privileged just to be a part of the family of God. And I pray that we would take seriously the mandate that you have given to us to be those agents of change in a dark and a dismal place. To be the salt and the light that you have told us that we are. We don't have to be it, we already are it. And I pray that we would please you, really please you, as we together journey towards making this world what you want it to be. God, I want to pray right now for those who have been so badly affected, to those who have lost loved ones, not just through this, but through the corona thing as well and through in any other way as well. Lord, be gracious, be kind to those people. 
May your presence just surround them, indwell them, and bless them. And give them today, God, a tangible sense of wellness to know that you are with them. Pray, Lord, for our businessmen who have had such a taken such a terrible knock. Businesses being burned and looted and and Lord, the aftermath could be quite challenging, but with your help, I know that at the end of the day it's going to be better than it was before as we rely upon you. But Lord, I pray for our business people, have your hand upon them. Pray for our schools, for our universities, for our parents, for our families, for our government leaders. Protect us, Lord, from those who would seek to corrupt and those who would seek to to do wicked and evil things. But we recognize today, Lord, that they are pathetic because our fight is not against them. Our fight is in the heavenlies. It's against principalities and powers. And I pray that as our church mobilize in prayer through humility and brokenness, that you would honor that which we seek to do in your name. But Lord, we're hopeful. You've told us to be. We're not hopeless people. We have the Spirit of God within us to help us in whatever situation that faces us. And I'm just looking forward to hearing great stories of how you have helped and blessed your people in these coming days. Go with us now, Lord, we pray. Bless the church around the world, around our town, around our country. And we pray this in the incredibly powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Folks, Lizanne is going to be singing a beautiful song in worship as we close our service today. Won't you join with us? It's all about coming out of the ashes. Let's sing about it, should we? Cheers. Thank you, Pastor Trev. Church, I'm so glad to be closing the service with this song. I know that you've been practicing because I've seen some of your Facebook pages. So we're going to lift the roof with I raise a hallelujah. Let's sing together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder
many times and I'm going to say it again. There's something so powerful that happens when God's children choose to praise Him in spite of their circumstances, in the storm. We've seen it throughout the Bible. One of my favorite stories is the story of King Jehoshaphat and those three armies that rose against him and how they didn't have to lift a finger. All they did was praise the Lord all the way to the battlefield and when they got there, everyone was dead. Or what about Paul and Silas singing praises to the king in prison and then the ground shakes, the prison doors fly open and the shackles fall off them. That's the same God that we serve today. That is our King of Kings and He rules and He reigns. And that's who we sing to this morning. I want you to be encouraged by that. And we're gonna sing together one more time. And as I said at the beginning, we're gonna sing. Praise the hallelujah. for sharing this time with us. Um, I pray this week is a way, way better week than the last. Stay safe and God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to